7 is where we're going to be tonight. Oh, hey, Mary, can I get that clicker? Where is that? Oh. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> there we go. The series is some of the same old songs. Um, we've, we've done Psalm 139, Psalm uh, 19, Psalm 90. Uh, we did Psalm 23, Psalm 91. And tonight uh, we're doing Psalm 127. Next week will be the last week of them. And I think we're going to end it with Psalm 46. Not 100% sure yet. But anyway, these are psalms that are more or less familiar to us already. And um, uh, so um, when I say that, I mean, usually when you, you think of these psalms, there's probably a sound bite, a verse or two that just sort of pops in your mind. You think, I pretty familiar with that one and it is a play on words some of the same old psalms because um, that that doesn't mean to imply it well we're used to them but I just I remember this guy that worked at a, uh, a lumber yard where my brother worked and every day Jamie would go into work and he'd say to him hey how's it going and he had this thing he'd say same old soup warmed over you know, <laughs> just the same old soup warmed over and um, Sometimes we can kind of think um, with Scripture, oh, I've heard it before. That's one of the same old soup formed over. In fact, as I'm getting ready for 2018, I'm, I'm excited because I'm reading the Scripture again from beginning to end. And, and I just know, I, I estimate that I've read through the Bible probably 30 times from beginning to end. I, I think, and that's... That's a pretty close estimate. But every time I do, I'll read something that I think I've read a bunch of times before. And is it this way for you guys? It's like, like I never read that. Like, it's so fresh and so new. And I never, never knew that was uh, even, you know, it never touched me in that way. So it can kind of be that way with the Psalms. And, and um, first, even before we get into Psalm uh, 127, and let me see that. That's the one we're going to look at. But before we get there, um, I want you to notice some of the intentionality of the Psalms. Um, not, not even just this Psalm yet, but I want you to think about a few things about the way that they grouped the Psalms together. For instance, this section of Psalms that we're looking in tonight, there is like a master plan. It's very, very intentional. Think about this. Starting with Psalm 117. Psalm 117 is the shortest psalm in the Bible. Two verses. Um, it, it sandwiches Psalm 118 because Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. And uh, Psalm 119 is very interesting because it's 176 verses. But really what it does, Psalm 119 takes, it takes each letter in alphabetical order of the Hebrew alphabet, starting with Aleph, Beta, and Gimel, and goes all the way through. And it, each one of those verses, that section starts with that letter. And there's eight verses for each letter. It's just a perfect symmetry. And um, it's really intentional. So... It's interesting that Psalm 117 is the shortest verse in the Bible. Psalm 119 is the shortest psalm in the Bible, I should say. Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible. Uh, psalm 118 has some real in, uh, interesting things about it, and I won't go into all of it, but it, it has this repeated phrase that occurs over and over. It, it says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Psalm 118 is, a, is an infamous psalm, and what we believe is that people chanted that phrase while the remainder of the psalm was recited. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let all Israel say, His love endures forever. You can just imagine this uh, mantra being repeated over and over, and the power of that is as the entire crowd is saying, His love endures forever. And there's some people who have researched that um, right at Psalm 118 is the very halfway point of the entirety of Scripture. If you were to go from beginning 
to the end. So, um, you know, I, I do not get off on things like the Da Vinci Code and the, the Hidden Bible Code. But all I would say about things like that, it doesn't surprise me a bit. I think we'll get to heaven and we will realize we had no idea how perfect the Bible was in every little way. And um, so uh, it, it's just interesting then, immediately after those three, so you got Psalm 117, 118, 119, and Psalm 120, you start the, song, the Psalms of Ascent. There's 15 Psalms of Ascent. If you were to take Psalm 117, 18, and 19 and combine them, and then set them side by side with Psalms 120 through 134, the Psalms of Ascent, they would be like mirror bookends to one another. And we don't really quite know everything about what does that mean, Psalm of the Ascent. It's like, for instance, in Psalm 127, before you even start reading, it has the title, this is a Psalm of the Ascent. We can only really guess, and some of the best teachers have researched that and said, that the Psalms of Ascent in ancient Israel represented climbing up to the temple of, of God. And in fact, there were, uh, uh, there were 15 steps that led from the court of women up into the court of, of the temple of the Israelites. And those 15 steps, it is believed that people would step on step number one and they would recite Psalm 120. And then step on the next step and so recite Psalm 121. And as they're saying the Psalms of Ascent, they are ascending up to the Temple Mount, um, which would be beautiful. Then some people even say it went further than that. The, the Israelites, the choir of the Levites, would line up across the steps and recite or maybe even sing the psalm and then take the next step and sing the psalm and work their way up to the, to the court. Um, that would be very powerful. Then there's, uh, there's probably more support for this. Maybe both are true. But a lot of uh, Bible teachers believe that the Psalm of Ascents every year as people were working their way into Jerusalem for the various festivals throughout the year, as they're coming up hill, because you ascend up to Jerusalem, as you're working your way up, they would be reciting Psalms 120, 121, 122, all the way up. And so um, uh, it's just just uh, interesting. So now with that backdrop, let's look at this one tonight, Psalm 127. It really addresses uh, three of man's preoccupations. And when I say man's, it might even be accurate to say that males are preoccupied with these things more than females. I don't know if that's true, but mm -hmm. it seems to be. But for all humans, for all humans, th these are some preoccupations. But I would say, especially guys, and here they are, building, security, and raising a family. Now, maybe we could say it this way, building, Guys love to build things. Security, ladies love security more than guys. I don't know that that's true. I think that's true. Um, raising a family, that's, that's something we all uh, think is honorable and, and aspire to. So this psalm challenges us to trust in the Lord when we're going to build our houses and our homes and our families. Um, the, the title of this one says that it is by Solomon, a song of Solomon. But just to let you know, there's a little bit of um, question about that. It may have been built, uh, it, may have been, it may have been written by Solomon, but many people believe it was written by David and that instead of by Solomon, it's more to be understood to Solomon. Almost like if you were dedicating a book to somebody, like if I wrote a book and dedicated to Stephanie, well, this would be, um, this, is, this is a song that David wrote and dedicated it to his son Solomon. We don't know for sure. Um, either one of them could have written it, but for sure it was somebody important, someone who was, 
who is a king. And, and here's the first part of it. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Um, we need more than human effort, right? We need the Lord. We, if God is not in the mix, it will not add up. You can, you can work your fingers to the bone, but unless it's devoted to God, um, if God isn't at the center of everything that we do, then really it's, it's pointless, it's meaningless. We depend on Him. Uh, Benjamin Franklin one time said these words, and I think this is pretty powerful, but it really ties in with this thought, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. He said, and if a sparrow falls to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? I mean, now think about that. Here's one of our founding fathers for our nation, and he says, if God notices when a little sparrow falls to the nest, if, if he's paying attention that much, it's not very likely that you can build an empire unless he does it, unless he's behind it. And I think that's good. We, we depend on him for everything, everything we do. Um, someone else said these words, and it's a popular quote, and I'm sure you've heard it in one form or another, but we should work as though all depends on us. And we should pray as if all depends on God. In other words, we've got to be hard workers. God doesn't want lazy people. He wants us to work with our hands and be uh, constructive and, and contribute. But we just trust Him that He's the one who does all of the real success of it. So the word house here, it's interesting. There's, there's a lot of times the case with Hebrew words, but words can mean more than one thing, and you kind of define it by the context more than, say, the specific word. Although, I mean, I think that's kind of true in every language, really. Some words are the same word, but depending on how we use them, they might mean different things. And, and this word, house, um, it definitely can mean house, but it can also be translated not just like a dwelling, but it can be translated palace. It can be translated temple, because it has kind of a notion of a place of worship. It can even be translated dynasty, which is, I mean, that's pretty interesting. Maybe David did write this dedicated to his son Solomon, thinking our dynasty is going to endure, endure only if God's in charge. But uh, it can mean all of those things. But mainly, I think in this meaning, by this context, it has to be the last definition, which is really about family. This word for house can mean your household. You're the people who live in your household. Unless the Lord builds the household, unless the Lord builds the, the family, the laborers work in vain. Um, so uh, we need God's protection from things like thieves and robbers and um, military and enemies and threats to the city. We, we need God's protection for all of that. But even more than that, I think about this when we're looking at our, our household. We need God's protection from uh, false philosophies, false spirituality, uh, false emotional and physical entities that, um, that really want to destroy our families. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. In, unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. I mean, that, that seems to be saying that you can have the best security system and money can buy, but you need the Lord. That's really what we need most of all, more than anything. Um, reading on, in vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food. Um, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Those are powerful words. He grants sleep to those he loves. Now, I don't want to say if you've ever struggled with uh, insomnia, well, this means that you're not spiritual. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I do think there's a, a truth here that um, if you ever struggled in it, that area, 
then we need to just remember, what, a, what is it that's bothering you deep down? Because the Lord created sleep as a regular part of our cycle, and, um, and He gives sleep to the ones He loves. He, if we're able to just release it to Him and just let it go, whatever it is, and just lay down and sleep, then why oh, it's beautiful. Now, I know sometimes there's other things going on. It's not just a... It may not be that you're wound up, or it, there may be some physiological things, and I get that. But um, I, I tell you, it's not an area that I've ever struggled with yet. In fact, Stephanie gets so annoyed at me, she will be mid-conversation, right in the middle of a sentence, and I'll be saying, yeah, uh-huh, and then boom, I mean, I'm gone. I have never wrestled with falling asleep, but sometimes it's just, I mean, instantly. And, uh, um, but um, a man, this, and this is really saying, verse 2 is really saying to us that hard work is not the answer. Now, I want to balance this, and we really, really need balance in this area. But a man who labors hard apart from the Lord, um, you know, he's going to have bread to eat. He's going to have um, a place to live, and, and, but he, he can get a good paycheck and all of those things. But there's something missing unless, unless it's really devoted to the Lord. And I know that you guys are with me on this. I, if we really need good balance in this area. Because God expects us to be good hard workers. God doesn't want slothfulness. And he doesn't, you know, one of my pet peeves is, is when a man is an able-bodied man, but refuses to work. All of that gets me. You know, because um, that's, that's the way God has made us to be and is actually part of the judgment of, against Adam and Eve when sin entered into the world. Okay, you're going to earn a living by the sweat of your brow. And, uh, and I'm, by the way, I'm so thankful that, that I never have to experience childbirth. I, you, that was also part of that indictment. And ladies, you're going to bear children, and it's going to be painful from this point forward. And, um, but uh, we need real, real balance in this area. Unless the Lord's, the, those are pretty important Words. Everybody just look at that for a moment. Unless the Lord builds the house. That, that phrase could be for, I mean, everything of this whole psalm, everything hinges on unless the Lord. And you can apply it to every area of your life. Um, if we do things on our own, then it's not going to be blessed. But the Lord has to be number one. Unless the Lord builds the house. Pretty important words. And then read on this. This next part, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from Him. I love that. Um, children are not a curse. Children are a blessing. Um, look, look at this. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Um, in today's culture, there is more and more that seems to be a fear of having children. I've heard this comment more in the last decade than I remember at any time in my life, but in different ways I've heard people say, why would I bring a child into this crazy world? And I, I understand, man, there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of bad things happening in the world. But there have always been bad things in the world. I, you know, I, I was watching on TV a, a, a series about hunting Hitler, and, and um, there's conspiracists who believe that he actually escaped and faked his own death and went to, down to Argentina. And I've always said, oh, that's bogus. But I'm going to tell you something. They discovered 10 buildings on an island off the coast that were designed by his top um, nuclear scientists, and those buildings are still there today, meant to house nuclear weapons to be aimed at the United States. And I don't know, I don't know what to make of that, but I'm telling you, there was something going on. But, but I, I lived through the time, I was just a baby, actually, when, um, I take that back. I'm younger than I think. I was not alive when Kennedy was president. 
But I think a lot of you were. So Kennedy, the, I mean, I, I remember just the history of reading about the fear of nuclear attack, how it was so close. I mean, it was just right there. The, the, the comments that I've heard was, you know, his finger was on the button, his thumb was on that red nuclear button. It was, it was just that close. There's always been horrible things in the earth. I mean, at least our, our cultures now are more civil than in ancient times. Like, they were, they were so barbaric. They would come in and behead entire villages and just, uh, you know. So I, I get that. I understand that we, there's a lot of bad things. But we need good, godly families in today's world. It, to me, it's like a preservative. It's like salt. It's the salt of the earth. And... and uh, uh, Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Um, it even goes on to say they will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Um, and basically, the ending here is just an expression of, uh, it would be a way of saying, they're just going to make you proud. Your kids are going to be upright citizens. I don't, I don't think the court is speaking of here is necessarily... Um, like uh, having to appear before a judge or, or being a witness on the stand. I think that, remember this is a king writing this, possibly even a king dedicating it to his prince, son, who will be king. And it's, it's just a way of saying, your, your quiver is full of them, boy, that's a blessing. Now here, here's the thing. Um, that, that verse right there, like arrows in the hands of a warrior for children born as one's youth. Um, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Um, I, knew, I knew a man one place one, one time. He said, you know, he's a Christian man. He, he had a company that was named Quiverful. That was the name of the company. He and his wife had five kids, and I know they and actually planned to have more. And, um, but here's, you know, this is not an indi indictment, but it's just, a, it's just true. This particular situation went really bad. Um, the, the family didn't do well. The family split up and lots of pain, lots of anger. And they all went different ways. And um, in many ways, that pain has continued for decades. Um, it's not just about having children. I mean, you can have arrows in the quiver, but you have to know how to shoot the arrows. And, um, and yet I speak as one who has a son in prison. You know, but I'm so grateful for Proverbs 22, 6 that ties right into this train of a child in his way that he should go. It's speaking of he has a designated path that he should be, that, that should be the trajectory of his life. And even when he's old, he will not depart from it. And um, I've always emphasized the even when he's old part. And, and I say it this way. It doesn't mean that when he's old, but all the way through, even when he's old, he's still going to remain faithful to it. And yet, um, we had a time where our son walked so far away from God. We didn't want that. And I know dozens and dozens of parents who have done their very best um, to raise children to fear God. And for some reason, it, you can have two kids raised by the same mom and dad, in the same family, same values, taken the same church, given the same principles, and one chooses to go this way and another chooses 100 miles the other direction. I don't understand that. Other than each child has their own heart, their own decisions, and they make their own choices. But I really do believe that as we train children in the way to go, where they will serve God and we show them, we don't just tell them go to church, we take them, we model it, we live it for them. Um, and, and we shoot that arrow the correct way. Man, it, it returns blessings. And uh, well, it, it's nothing short of a miracle, but I'm so thankful to God that both of our boys are, 
are serving Christ. Uh, that, that just means the world to me. And yet I know there's not a 100% a guarantee. You can never guarantee those things. But I think we, we do the best we can. How do we do that? We build the house by submitting to the Lord in every way. I want to just close with a, a prayer of blessing. And um, I want to pray over our homes. And for those of us who, um, who have children who have moved out, and maybe there's even another generation, even that third level of grandchildren, how awesome, or great-grandchildren. I just want to pray the heritage of blessing be passed on in our families. So, Heavenly Father, tonight we just come to you asking for your hand of favor and blessing upon our homes. And when we say our homes, we're talking about our households. Actually both. Lord, we do pray that you would bless our homes with good, solid construction. Let us all have a home. Let the appliances last forever. Let the, um, let the foundations be strong. No cracks or any of those things. And, and let our physical homes be blessed by you. And not just our homes, but all of our possessions, our very land. Let it be blessed by you. But especially we're talking about our family, our household. We pray that you would bless our children. Father, just right now, we call to mind our children and we bless them to you, God. They are a great blessing to our lives. Oh, Lord, you blessed us when you put these arrows in the quiver. We've tried our best, Father, to, to shoot the arrow in the right way. But we know that unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers work in vain. And we're trusting you. Father, we pray protection upon our children tonight. We pray blessings and no sickness, no illness. We ask for promotion and honor to come their way. We ask that you would lift them up. And especially if there are some who have wandered from the faith, right now we call them to attention. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would be the most important thing about their lives. Oh, God, just love them and encourage them in a special way. Right now, this very moment, show them your love and your compassion. Protect them in all their ways and bring them home. And Father, we are speaking blessings upon the generations. Blessing from one generation to the next. Let godliness be the inheritance that is passed down from generation to generation. We speak those blessings over our family. And we pray that you would be at the center of our homes. In the name of Jesus, we ask all of this. Amen. Amen. Amen.